to the thank you uh, for joining us at the Colorado Business Roundtable event, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and the challenges and opportunities for healthcare response and innovation. My name is Debbie Brown, and I'm the president of Colorado Business Roundtable, and we're a public policy organization comprised of executives from some of the state's largest employers working to strengthen Colorado's economic vitality. We engage with elected leaders, business and nonprofit leaders, and other street strategic allies to improve the business community, and also to unapologetically amplify the voice of business. We're engaged in public policy, not only in Colorado, but throughout the country and also globally. Colorado Business Roundtable is the state affiliate of the National Business Roundtable based in Washington, DC. So what does the Colorado Business Roundtable do? Uh, we represent the private sector. We've been involved in short and long-term recovery efforts, particularly around COVID-19. Today, we're gonna to be hearing a lot about the healthcare sector, of course, and the challenges and opportunities regarding Coloradans health and well-being. In particular, our lane has been more regarding the economic impacts of COVID-19 and working not only with the governor's office and members of our Colorado congressional delegation, but also weighing in on issues regarding recovery. In fact, if you go to our website, you'll see a report that we recently launched talking about the road to recovery for Colorado. We also convene regularly with folks that we like to call the ABCG, academia, community, business, and government, because we know that when we collaborate and we work together, we can come up with policies and recommendations um, that really support all of Colorado. And so we do some of those roundtables like today, we've done other roundtables on issues of bioscience, transportation, economic development and trade, for example. We also sometimes take issues, uh, we take stands on issues, particular issues at the legislature or at the ballot box. And in particular, we see business as a force for good. We know that we're all in this together and a good job certainly supports um, Colorado, Colorado's ability to work and thrive. And you'll wanna keep track of a, a launch that we'll have in January as well called a Face as a Business campaign that really talks about the ecosystem of business and that business really isn't about a building at all, it's about the people and lives who are impacted. So that's a little bit about Colorado Business Roundtable and we welcome you back for some other programming or to partner with us in the future. So now on to why we're here today. COVID-19 hit the world with unexpected force in early 2020. Businesses closed, schools shut down, and the world ground to a halt as we responded to new pandemic guidelines. Well, what didn't grind to a halt, of course, with our, was our healthcare system, as we're gonna hear about today. During this time, the nation's healthcare community stepped up and stepped up in a really big way in Colorado. To understand this new virus and provide the care patients needed, they found new ways of collaborating, leveraging technology, and providing care through new channels and supporting the rapid advancement of treatment and cures. Today, we're convening a group of business leaders and healthcare professionals who are on the front lines for a deep look into our healthcare system through the lens of the COVID-19 pandemic. We will consider lessons learned and the opportunities that could prove highly valuable in the future of healthcare. So before we jump into introductions to our esteemed panel, I first want to introduce Chris Brown, who's going to lay a little bit of groundwork through some partnership that we've done with Common Sense Institute, uh, because there are some public policy considerations as well to just help frame some of the issues as we look through, again, to the folks who are working on the ground. So first I'll introduce Chris Brown for some brief remarks. Chris is the Director of Policy and Research with the Common Sense Institute where he leads the research efforts of CSI to provide insightful, accurate, and actionable information on the implications of public policy issues throughout the state of Colorado. The Colorado Business Roundtable has benefited from its partnership with CSI, counting on CSI for research insights, and we are delighted to have Chris with us today. So Chris Brown, we'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Debbie, and uh, very much looking forward to this debate today. Uh, I guess I'm a little slow here. Let me pull up a few slides and I may be the only one that has some slides here. Um, let me know if you have any issues seeing them. Is that, is that pulled up? Okay, so yeah, again, thank you very much for the introduction. And, you know, as Debbie said, uh, I, I think, you know, 2020 has been an, an incredible, 
a disruptive year and uh, you know i think no industry uh, has faced sort of uh, more hardship and 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 come to the challenge you know uh, similar to healthcare and so um, you really, you know, commend and thank the healthcare leaders on the call today and the business leaders involved in healthcare and providers participating today. So thank you very much. But as Debbie said, I'm going to maybe take a step back and think about the public policy lens that really has been uh, being heavily debated for the last couple of years. And we expect to resurface here in the coming year and has been in the center of our focus uh, in focus of our research for some time. Um, you know, a place I often start is an area I think a lot of us can agree and, and recognize some of the challenges that the industry and, and uh, taxpayers and, and households have faced as healthcare costs really have grown much faster than a lot of other goods, services, and to put pressure on, on budgets, again, across the state, across um, uh, across households, and has really been a central focus for, for policymakers. Um, I think there's an important dynamic that really want people to understand in this uh, issue is really the difference in payments uh, relative to cost, because a lot of where the policy effort is, is focused is on the payer side and how to reform payers and how to address costs uh, that, uh, for payers, commercial payers, uh, public payers, those in the individual market. And this is information from Colorado's uh, hospital cost ship analysis published earlier this year from the Division of Healthcare Policy and Financing that looks at this longstanding trend in the difference in payments relative to cost for commercial payers relative to public payers. And, uh, you know, again, healthcare has faced a lot of disruptions over the last several years particularly uh, through a large increase in public payers to expansion of Medicaid. And we can see the divergence here in those margins um, since 2015. And that has really put, uh, and the pressure on the, on the commercial market has really put pressure on uh, policymakers, legislators um, to come up with solutions. And one of the main uh, focuses of that debate that again, we expect to resurface here possibly early next year is surrounding the debate around introducing a public option. And this is something that uh, we have researched, issued three papers on thus far, and really just want to resurface and flag as will likely be center for debate uh, early next year. Um, but it focuses on reducing payments to uh, providers through the introduction of a, of a more regulated uh, uh, individual insurance plan uh, called, called the Colorado Option Plan, as it was sort of finally uh, determined in the bill early this year, that really forces a decision for providers as their payments are reduced by payers, but their costs remain unchanged. And, you know, something that we've modeled and we've worked with Navigant Consulting, a national healthcare modeling group to look at the impacts of, of this type of policy and see and really show the, tr the trade-off that providers would face as they look at reducing costs in a way that might impact uh, access or quality or uh, sort of further that trend that we see in cross-subsidization or that cost shift that occurs on commercial payers. Um, our research focused on several scenarios or showed several scenarios around how the public option would be introduced, whether just in the individual market or likely scaled to the small group and, and, and group markets. Um, and one of our uh, key partners and board members is with the Rocky Mountain uh, Mechanical Contractors Association. And after we did this analysis, ran these scenarios through his plan as a, as a large commercial insurance plan and showed that, uh, you know, due to the potential cross subsidization or further cost shift, his cost would increase by uh, over a million dollars a year or $420 per payer as a result of the introduction of the public option as it was designed earlier this year. And this sort of exacerbates this dynamic that exists in the market today. 
So, you know, at the end of the day, uh, really what I'll leave you with and, and to think and ponder as the, the policy debate unfolds is, you know, how can we come up with solutions that address, you know, really the underlying costs and some of the structural problems that do exist, as opposed to just uh, putting price caps or limiting the payments that providers uh, have to live with. And, um, you know, I think the impacts of, of COVID-19 and the, and the economic impacts and revenue impacts that have played out over the last several months really put that in focus and will play out for several years. So we want policymakers and Coloradans to understand this critical issue and the impacts on, on all of us. Um, maybe a small plug here, but encourage you to go to our website and you can download our research, uh, sign up for our newsletter and learn more about what we've done and what we hope to continue to do. So thank you, Debbie, for your partnership and leadership and I'll turn it back to you. I think you're still muted, Debbie. <laughs> Thanks. I was the first one to do that. It seems like somebody's always got to have that happen. So the pressure's off for the rest of you now since I had that mute problem. Thank you, Chris, for sharing that information. Um, now I'm going to work on some introductions for our panel today. And before I do that, I just want to say thank you on behalf of Colorado. If you haven't been thanked enough, let me be someone who offers gratitude for what you've done in caring for Coloradans during this incredibly difficult time. And I'm excited to hear about, um, you know, some of the some of the challenges and opportunities that you've seen, how you're overcoming them, and kind of the good news I think that we're sharing today. But um, just wanted to share that little bit of gratitude on behalf of uh, myself and Colorado Business Roundtable. So first we have um, Dr. Uh, J.P. Um, Vallon, who is the Executive Vice President and Chief Clinical Officer at SCL Health, which includes St. Joseph Hospital and Good Samaritan Medical Center, and Lutheran and Platte Valley Medical Centers, and also St. Mary's Medical Center in Grand Junction. Dr. Vallon is responsible for integrating and providing direction for all clinical activity including the SCL Health Medical Group, Acute Care Clinical Operations, Quality, Safety, and Risk, and Medical Informatics. He played a lead role in coordinating care across the state's hospital network during the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome. Next, we have um, Dr. Phil Stale, Chief Medical Officer at the Medical Center of Aurora and Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital in the Health One system. Dr. Stale is responsible for the clinical agenda, regulatory readiness, and executive support to the medical staff, and he co-chairs and he chairs Health One's Trauma Advisory Council. A board-certified trauma surgeon, Dr. Stale played a key role in ensuring the innovations in patient care during COVID-19 were widely shared across the healthcare network. So welcome, Dr. Stale. Thanks, Debbie. Next, we have Josh Neff, Enterprise VP of Integration and Rural Health with Centura Health. Josh manages the integration of rural hospital acquisitions and manages Centura's rural health network and initiatives. This includes leading the CEOs, finance and operations executives for the rural hospitals. Josh has a unique view on rural health care in Colorado and played a key role in ensuring Coloradans receive care, rural Coloradans receive care during the COVID-19 pandemic. So welcome, Josh. We also have um, the Honorable Susan Beckman, Regional Administrator for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Susan has an extensive background in government from city level to federal level. She's been a councilwoman on Littleton City Council, a commissioner in Arapahoe County, and a member of the Colorado House of Representatives. And in January of this year, Susan started her appointed position with the federal government as Regional Administrator for the U.S. Health and Human Services. Susan ensures the department maintains close contact with the state, local, and tribal partners and addresses the needs of communities served through the HHS programs and policies in the region. HHS has been active in the nation's COVID-19 response. They have awarded federal funding to health centers across the country for coronavirus preparedness and response and supported the healthcare system in meeting screening and testing needs acquiring medical supplies and boosting telehealth capacity. So welcome, Susan. And we also have Dr. Jandell Allen Davis, President and CEO of Craig Hospital in Denver. Dr. Allen Davis is a board certified OBGYN and a former professor of obstetrics and gynecology at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. 
Previously, she was the Vice President of Government and External Relations for Kaiser Permanente Colorado. In this role, she was responsible for Kaiser's community benefit investment, um, local and national government relations, and internal and external communications and brand management. So welcome, Dr. Alan Davis. So we're going to go ahead and get rolling. This is an incredibly esteemed group that we have here today. And again, our appreciation to them. And it was a little interesting to even have some conversation before the webinar started about um, some optimism and some challenges faced. And so it's great to be able to share it with our attendees today. So first, we're going to talk about challenges and opportunities, because it's been quite a year, in particular for those of you in the healthcare sector. And I want to start with Dr. Vallon. Uh, so I understand each hospital faced different challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic, depending on their community and patient mix. I thought we would begin um, by asking you and then Dr. Stale and Josh Neff to talk about how your hospital addressed this particular crisis. So Dr. Valen, give us a sense of how SCL responded. Great, right, thanks Debbie. Um, and uh, you're right, uh, it's exciting uh, today to think that we've got a vaccine. We've given uh, over a thousand vaccines in Colorado just in the last 36 hours, which is really exciting. But I wanna take us back maybe and take everybody back, although it feels like this pandemic has been going on forever, uh, it's really 10 months. So think back to, uh, to March of, of this year. Um, and if you think about how quickly things evolved, we had the first positive case of COVID in the state of Colorado uh, about the 5th of March. And uh, about two weeks later, the entire state was shut down. It was moving that quickly. And so uh, at that time, we had, as a health system, recognized that COVID was going to be a possibility that we might get some cases uh, in the state. At the time, uh, if you remember back at that point in time, no one really knew much about COVID. And we had heard things about a little bit out of Wuhan, China. We had heard a little bit out of Italy and what was going on. But there was just a lot of, uh, of uncertainty about how many people were going to get sick, how sick were they going to get, and what was going to happen. Um, we as a health system, uh, and our first response was to put together what we call an incident command structure. And that is really a way to really change how we, uh, how we respond to crises. Hospitals have long prepared for this. If there's a local disaster, a, a bus crash, a mass casualty event, a flood, they would do that. This was the first time that we had stood up an incident command structure that lasted and it continues to, to, to go today. But it is really repurposing our, our teams to respond quickly, to know what's happening with, uh, with, the, with the event and um, and coordinate all of the activity within the hospital. It really changed and created a new leadership structure uh, with a sort of a command and control and rapidly respond. Uh, that incident command met, uh, we met uh, multiple times per day and met with all of our hospitals on calls at least three times a day to make sure everybody was aligned with the, with the response. As we did that, our biggest challenges on the front end, uh, I think everybody remembers back, uh, one of the biggest challenges was PPE, uh, personal protective equipment and the availability of masks and gloves and gowns and things like that for, uh, for all of our healthcare workers. Historically, we had, we had worked in a Walmart type uh, just-in-time supply chain, which worked great in, in normal times, but when we needed suddenly a massive amount of equipment, it wasn't there. And so uh, we rapidly uh, scaled up to look at extending that use, about reprocessing, and then partnering with lots of people in the business community. And we had a lot of folks from the business community come in and help, donating supplies. We had distilleries making disinfectant for us. We had a blind company helping to make masks for us, uh, which was incredibly, incredibly important. We also focused a lot on stockpiling our medications and our testing and using um, our integrated supply chain to make sure that we positioned equipment all around our hospitals so that as patients started to come in, we could respond to that. Next thing we did was we focused a lot on our surge plans and our ability to uh, expand and see more patients in our hospitals, uh, converting units that are not usually used for, for patient care or long-term patient care so that we could, uh, we could actually increase capacity should we need it. 
Luckily, we did not need that in the spring, um, and we're and we haven't yet needed to use that level of of, uh, of space. And then we uh, the other thing that we needed to do was focus on how do we continue care delivery. And um, when the state was locked down and people couldn't leave their home uh, and things, we needed to figure out a way to be able to continue to deliver necessary care, non-COVID care to patients. And one of the biggest things we did was also ramp up uh, our telehealth strategy and our ability to deliver telehealth and virtual health to patients. Um, as we did that, we started, uh, we, we were just in the process of launching some telehealth to give you a sense of how rapidly we expanded that. In February, we did about 50 visits. Uh, we were just piloting 50 visits to patients in their, in their homes. In March, we did 5,000. And in April, we did 17,000 uh, visits to patients so we could continue to deliver care to, to patients. We also came together and partnered with the with the other hospitals in Colorado and the hospital systems. I know we're going to talk about that at, at, at the end. I think that's a really great story. But just internally with, with us, it was a really an all hands on deck. How do we address and, and focus on, on COVID and our response to that? Mm -hmm. Very good. I'll turn it back to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Stale, uh, let me turn that question to you. What were the challenges and opportunities that your health one hospitals faced? Yeah, thanks, Debbie. And uh, Dr. Bellin gave an extremely eloquent uh, uh, so summary and overview that probably applied to all health systems. And uh, I pride myself that we worked across systems together across the state of Colorado, SCL, Health One, the University, Centura. We were all in this together with one goal only to keep our staff and team safe and to keep our community safe. What we did within Health One is uh, as you heard about the timing, the first patient was tested positive on March 5th. We actually cohorted the first so-called PUI, a patient under investigation on March 1st at the medical center of Aurora. And at the time it took nine days to get a test back from the CDC in Atlanta to know whether this patient is positive or not. In the meantime, we have rapid in-house testing where we know within 15 minutes, this is how far we came so in, in order to uh, align resources, we decided early on that our hospital medical center of Aurora, which is one of seven hospitals within uh, the Denver market of the Health One system will become the designated uh, 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 referral facility for COVID patients. So we became what I nicknamed on, on our daily incident command center calls, Hotel Corona. And we learned to fail fast. And I think that's the biggest achievement. We became extremely innovative with restricted resources, restricted knowledge. The reason why COVID patients are much likely to survive today in the second or third wave, however you wanna define it, is because of our knowledge and, and the treatments we have available now, which we did not in the first wave in March and April. So we became innovative fast, for example, Dr. Valin mentioned uh, PPE uh, uh, stewardship. What we did is we marked the doors of patients on our COVID units with red and green dots. A red dot would be a patient who's been tested positive for COVID. A green dot would be a person under investigation. And our team will be allowed to keep the PPE on from red to red rooms because those patients were known to be positive, but never from red to green. And so those, those were grassroots innovative approaches that we're still utilize, utilizing on this day to preserve uh, PPEs and to keep our staff safe and our patients safe. We utilized high uh, uh, technologies such as extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, a, a complex term that is, uh, the acronym is ECMO. Uh, in Wuhan, China, it was considered futile for COVID patients and 85% of those patients died at the Medical Center of Aurora, we had a more than 90% survival. Uh, and we were the second busiest hospital in Colorado in terms of COVID volumes. So we pride ourselves for saving lives. And on uh, September 11th, it was the first and only day where we had zero COVID patients. Mm -hmm. We thought we made it. And the second wave, I can sense it with my team here is combat fatigue. So we can't go through this one more time. And what I tell them is there's a goal in sight it's like running a marathon. You don't look at the end, run one mile at a time, the best you can. 
day by day because we know there will be an end. And Debbie, just before you started introductions, I had to leave for five minutes and we just vaccinated our first colleague at the Medical Center of Aurora five minutes ago. So there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Oh, that's a that's really great to hear. Um, what a great reason to leave the call to go be a part of that history. And I was um, telling the folks again before the call, because we tend to rep we represent the private sector on the business side. You know, really, the only hope of of stimulus coming out of this pandemic is really is the vaccine. So we're really grateful to hear all that those good news stories. So um, thank you for that. And then Josh, let's turn to you. I imagine that rural hospitals faced a slightly different challenge when faced with the COVID-19 crisis. Um, how did your hospitals respond? Give us kind of that rural perspective. Yeah, so it's interesting in that, so Centura has got 17 hospitals in our system with an additional 14 rural affiliated hospitals. And we've had two very different experiences between those two groups. And the majority of our 17 hospitals are along the front range, relatively urban settings. We've got a couple out in the rural markets. <clears throat> But our true worlds, which are our 14 affiliated hospitals, these are small critical access hospitals who are typically the heartbeat of their community. Um, typically the number one or two employer, and typically the number one or two economic driver. In some, in some rural markets, agriculture is the number one economic driver, and then usually it's, uh, it's healthcare. The challenge in the rural market was that the world stopped, but we weren't seeing, the, we weren't seeing COVID patients like we were seeing in the, in the uh, urban settings. And so the same issues that we were facing at our hospitals and at SCL and Health One and our, and our other um, systems in the region we're seeing in terms of we're now stopping elective procedures or time sensitive procedures and our beds in the cities were filling up with, with COVID patients. The rural markets <clears throat> who on a good day have a one or 2% profit margin if they're lucky and that includes a lot of tax dollars and everything else we also stopped our elective procedures as well, even though we weren't faced with the influx of COVID patients. And so our, our volumes fell off 80, 85, and in some cases, 90%, um, which then required us to begin to furlough staff. Um, we had all of our, our um, incident command planning and things of that nature. And those rural critical access hospitals, and my two other colleagues mentioned, both mentioned PPE, those critical access hospitals have an even more limited access to PPE and typically on a distro GPO distribution list, a lot of those folks are way down uh, towards the bottom. <clears throat> and so Centura as a system decided we needed to support them um, as much as we can. And so the PPE that we needed in, in the rural or the urban markets was a little bit different than what we were seeing a shortage of in the rural markets. Um, we actually uh, built our own disposable gown manufacturing in our corporate office. We took a couple conference rooms and turned it into um, basically a factory setting where we had all of our non-clinical folks who weren't on the front line caring for those COVID patients, literally making plastic disposable gowns to the tune of about 2000 a day. And we were able to ship those out to our, our rural partners. Um, the other challenges that we saw as it relates to um, kind of what the impact it had <clears throat> was it those organizations typically depend on us because of the level of acuity of those patients to move patients towards the urban markets when they're relatively sick. Well, when our bed utilization went so high in Denver and Colorado Springs and other places, there were non-COVID patients in rural markets that needed to be transferred out, stroke patients, heart attack patients, all of those things, that, that it became a challenge to move those patients through the system because all of us were challenged with bed space. Um, and so that created a number of trickle down issues for us. Now we've got an ICU that's you know, relatively packed with COVID patients. We've got cardiac patients, stroke patients that need to get in. <clears throat> and so it created some unique opportunities for us as a group of systems to work with the Colorado Hospital Association to develop a methodology where if the surge continued to push forward, we were potentially gonna take relatively unsick but sick patients in our hospitals and potentially push those out into the rural markets where those patients could actually get cared for in the same manner, opening up some bed space uh, in the urban markets. And so it really took, it was a bit of a twist. Um, and and as, as I said initially, a, a very different experience between kind of our rural affiliates versus uh, our, our non-rural uh, non partners. And so 
We have continued to struggle with um, seeing volumes go down. We are just now starting to see as the second wave hit the cities, that was the first wave for many of the rural communities. Um, we've got a lot of rural communities across Colorado and even some from the Centura system in the Can on the Kansas side where you really have to have a reason to go there to go there. Um, and so a lot of folks weren't seeing the tourism. They weren't seeing folks from their communities leaving and then coming back in. And so while those communities were shut down from an economic perspective, <clears throat> they were relatively COVID free or had low COVID numbers for many, many months. And we've just started seeing in the last, you know, three to four months um, where our second wave has started to hit, we're seeing the initial wave, which then creates additional challenges because now those rural markets are actually having to take care of COVID patients. They're actually suffering from some PPE shortages that we're trying to support. Um, and it creates uh, interesting and unique challenges from that perspective. And uh, it's interesting to think about how, um, how that does you know, the wave hitting at different times, depending on what part of Colorado you're in or, um, you know, the different levels of, of preparedness and, and bed space and that kind of challenge. Uh, Dr. Alan Davis, I, I want to reach out to you. You're in a little bit different type of hospital as the CEO of Craig Hospital. Tell us, tell us what challenges and opportunities you face during this COVID time. Well, thanks, Debbie. And, um, you know, it is, a, it is a different hospital. It's a post-acute, in terms of acute care hospitals, but it's an acute rehabilitation hospital uh, that treats spinal cord and brain injured patients, these traumatic or acquired brain injuries. Um, it's funny, as you know, I'm an OBGYN and I will tell you now being two years here, these are some of the most vulnerable people who are in our hospital systems at any given time. And what the care that's given to them in the trauma centers and pretty much all of the systems here represented in others is just uh, phenomenal and remarkable. And our job then is to get folks back to, as we say, living their lives, but just doing it differently. Um, the vulnerabilities that they face can be respiratory, certainly skin and other things, or, or just the complication medically that could require that they go back to an acute care hospital. And we certainly see that. And so from the perspective of the things that we had to juggle, Number one was keeping COVID out of Craig. And we knew that, um, because we knew that first of all, this is essentially a long-term acute care hospital. And that's how we're licensed. And um, uh, which means that people come and they have very long lengths of stay, which means in some ways we look like a skilled nursing facility or you know, some of the, the, the folks with longer residential um, uh, stay. So, the way that I put it in general is that we had and are um, having to balance and consider a number of competing and conflicting priorities on any given day at any given time. In terms of what we did mechanistically, it's no different than what Dr. Vallon or Dr. Stale has said around having an incident command um, structure that's been set up. What I would say, though, is that uh, through the lens of um, being clear that we had, we, we were really more defense, that is keeping COVID out. Um, the things we had to do was really think about how many visitors came in, some of the same ways that the other systems had to think about it too. Um, but since these visitors literally are, um, they're residents in some ways, we have patient family housing here, we had to think about, we couldn't, certainly didn't want an outbreak over there and certainly didn't want folks bringing it in because rehabilitation is a family matter. It isn't something we do independently or, or um, individually. Although early on, just like others, when we weren't quite sure what we were up against or what we were dealing with, um, the darkest days at Craig Hospital um, for me were those first uh, few months or a few weeks where we said we had to have all caregivers go home. I was called heartless. I'll never forget that meeting with families. There were tears on their side as well as mine. Um, when we said we're going to, you know, because we don't know what we're facing, we don't know what you're facing. Um, we're going to have no caregivers here. My number one priority as we saw the sort of numbers start to come down by late April, early May, uh, was to get caregivers back because we did see some decline in terms of the ability to actually do good rehabilitation. So that then set a whole new set of challenges. And what we've realized and know so well is that um, keeping Craig safe is not just a staff responsibility, it's a patient responsibility and it's a caregiver responsibility. So um, I could go through all the reams and reams of paper and books and policies and um, 
uh, decision trees that we have created since the beginning of this to keep Craig safe. But what I will tell you uh, that the end of that particular story, and then maybe later I can talk about some of the lessons that we've learned, is that we have had no COVID cases in our patient population, which is I call both it's taken hard work and it's taken heart work. Um, and we've had very few cases among our um, staff. And what I tell them pretty much daily, uh, and certainly with our weekly all staff calls, Zoom did bring some goodness into our lives and the ability to talk to folks, a lot of folks all at, you know, fairly um, regularly and frequently, is that it says something about your sense of responsibility and duty owed to each other and to our mission and to our patients in terms of how you're, and we are behaving when we go home you know, and how we're moving about the, the community to try to minimize spread. Um, so, so it's been a very different sort of uh, battle that we've had to fight over here. Um, and, I, and as a national player, I also do know that there are people, there are patients, and I've had conversations with family members who are non-believers. <laughs> that don't, you know, think this, that we're all over exaggerating or we're making up, who knows. But, you know, as um, respectfully as we can be, and we are respectful and good to the folks we care for, that is not a belief we share here. So if your loved one is going to be cared for here, these are you know, sort of the policies and processes we follow. And the level of gratitude by the 99.9% .9 of people, even those, you know, and there are precious few who may be begrudgingly going along with things, the gratitude that we get from our patients, because it means that we can continue to do the rehabilitation we need to do, um, uh, is, is pretty overwhelming. And interestingly, the staff morale has stayed fairly high through all of this too. So anyway, I could, I mean, we built, uh, negative pressure rooms overnight. You know, we had none of those sorts of things. We built cohort units overnight. We had nurses who said, pick me if we have a COVID patient who's not ill enough to go back to one of our um, partners' um, acute care settings and we would um, have to keep them or would keep them here. We'll take care of them. We, you know, we learned to doff and don like the best of them. So, I mean, I could go on and on about the technical um, sorts of things, what I'd say overall, and maybe we talk a little bit later, but I think the bigger, um, the bigger, most remarkable and breathtaking thing, and you've heard it in the comments that have been said so far, um, is the, the, the leadership that has been shown throughout this, both from a collaboration and interdependence and a dependence and, and a making do, you know, which is sad because we shouldn't have to make do when it comes to PPE and those sorts of things, but we've had to, um, not we at Craig, but you know, as we hear stories here, as well as across the nation, it, it's, a, it's a real testament to um, all of our leadership having been truly tested throughout all of this in some ways that there are some great stories and books to be written on the other side of this. That's, that's so true. And I hope that when we're finally able to turn the page and you all get a wonderful vacation that there will be some really good books and um, stories that have come out of it. And Dr. Alan Davis, really you, you provided a great segue because I'd love to talk next about collaboration. And when I think about, uh, you know, the business community in my mind, I think about, okay, we're, there's competitors, you know, in these different sectors. And I'd love to lean into that a little bit more. And I'll start with Dr. Valen on this as well. But it seems like collaboration was really a theme throughout the year and had such a positive impact in how you were able to more quickly think about lessons learned and share with what um, you know, could be considered competitors. So tell us a little bit more, Dr. Valen, on how hospitals work together this year. Yeah, thanks, Debbie. I, I, it is um, it's truly unprecedented what, what has occurred here in Colorado. Um, you know, back when this all started in March, um, we quickly realized that COVID was going to be bigger than, than one physician, one hospital, one health system. This was really impacting everybody in a, in a, across the state. Uh, the CEOs of the health systems uh, came together quickly, huddled up quickly on a weekend on a call and said, you know, we, we need to figure out how we're going to partner and, and do this. And they actually helped to bring together all of the the chief medical officers and chief clinical officers from the health system. So I've been meeting with uh, with my counterparts from all the other health systems in the state. So including um, Health One and Centura and UC Health, uh, Denver Health, 
Boulder Community Health, uh, and then Banner uh, from up north, uh, we have come together. We actually first met on Sunday, March 15th. It was that big of a, a deal. We met on a Sunday. Uh, and, and really through the entire first wave of the pandemic, we literally met every single morning at eight o'clock in the morning for an hour to talk about what was happening, what we were seeing, what we were sharing. As we got through that first wave, we dialed it back a little bit to three days a week. Uh, but we continue to meet to this day. Actually, we met this morning. Uh, and this week with the vaccine going on, we've been meeting um, actually every day this week. We even met on Sunday because the, all the information was coming out about the vaccine uh, coming forward. Really un unprecedented, but it's been a, an incredible priority. A lot of what we have done has been to share information. We, we recognize that we were all in this together. And if we were going to help the people of Colorado and, and help the state navigate through this, we needed to do it together. Uh, and so immediately we started sharing data, how many patients we had in the hospital. And so we could actually know when we were seeing an increase in cases in the state, we could see when we were plateauing and we could predict when we were going down. Actually, even before um, there was widely available state data to be able to do that, we were sharing that. Um, Early, in our, early into this as well, uh, within the first week of that, we started meeting with the state. So we have been meeting with representatives from the, from the state of Colorado, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment weekly. We meet with Scott Bookman, who's the incident commander of the, uh, of the COVID response, as well as uh, folks from CDPHE, including the chief medical officer, chief operating officer from there, uh, Dr. Herlihy, who is the state epidemiologist, we meet with periodically to walk through some of the models and help to influence a lot of the state modeling around COVID so that they could work with planning. In fact, in our, on our call, uh, we, we continue to meet with the state uh, weekly. Yesterday on our call, actually Governor Polish joined us um, to talk about the vaccine and make sure we were all synced up on our plans for the vaccine. And so that's been an incredibly important um, uh, avenue for us and a connection point to the state uh, as well. Some of the things that we've done um, early on, as I shared, we knew nothing about COVID. And in fact, most folks in the, in the country, in the US didn't. If you remember back in March, there was a point in time where we had the fourth highest number of cases of any state in the country. Uh, and so we were really on that, the leading edge of the first wave of COVID in, in the United States. Uh, and so prior to us, knowledge and policies, we were helping to develop those on our own. We were sharing how to use PPE, how to save PPE. When there was a limited amount of testing available, we aligned on how to, uh, how to test and how to use those tests most effectively when it was a precious resource we shared between each other. So some systems uh, were able to scale up testing before others. And we actually shared to say, how do we test everybody appropriately rather than saying, well, one, one system can test and too bad for everybody else. Uh, we, we actually worked really well with that. We aligned with policies around use of PPE. We, were, we led with, with universal masking and we all aligned to, to mask all of our uh, healthcare workers uh, in all settings at all time. And we did that together uh, well in advance of that being kind of a standard process around the country uh, because, we, because we thought that was important. We aligned about visitor restrictions. Uh, Dr. Alan Davis talked about how, how challenging that was um, when we had to limit health uh, caregivers and visitors into our hospitals. Uh, we felt that as well, but we were doing it to protect the patients, to protect the healthcare workers to limit transmission. Uh, and it was important that we all did it together so that we were all uh, very much aligned on that. We've continued to meet through the summer plan for, for surges. We've shared best practices and ideas on how to do that. We know that, that what we have shared allowed us to take better care of patients and frankly save lives. Um, and we were able to show very quickly uh, outcomes for patients improve from March to April to May to June to July. Patients were surviving. We had lower mortality rates. We had lower use of mechanical ventilation, and we had lower length of stay. Uh, it was really impressive. And in fact, in Colorado, our outcomes on patients with COVID were better than many other states around the country. 
In fact, we were actually asked to, to share that information and publish that. And we actually recently published a study uh, in the New England Journal of Medicine Catalyst. Um, all of the health systems coming together, we co-wrote this, shared our data and, and presented that. And so it was presented nationally. And we've had other states uh, call us to say, tell us how you did it. Can you share that? You know, we want to learn how you did what you did. So we should be proud collectively in Colorado of, of where we are and we're in a great place to be for, for caring for patients. The thing that we did most recently, which I think has been really good as well, and as you, as you heard um, uh, Josh Neff share, the, the difference in timing of, of when, the, when things hit uh, in the rurals, uh, the, the rural facilities have been hit more uh, recently with, with COVID. Um, and we recently stood up something called the Colorado Hospital Transfer Center uh, in partnership with, with CHA, the Colorado Hospital Association, and all the systems. Uh, and what we have done is create a partner system so that every single rural, independent, standalone hospital in the state of Colorado has a go-to or a buddy system um, to be able to transfer patients to. And we've done that to make sure that patients, all patients in Colorado, even if they're not near one of the health systems, they have access to get into that. And that's been, that's been incredibly helpful. We're also then sharing all that same information out to the rural hospitals so they know how to best care for patients and best care for COVID patients so that we can support them. So it, it really has been an incredible testament to, to collaboration and coming together really with one single focus, and that is how do we help to save lives in the state of Colorado? Well, and that's so impressive. I'd love to, if that's a public report, I'd love to share that with the partners who are watching this video if they want more information on that. And, and of course, um, we collaborate with other roundtables around the country. So um, it could be a really interesting thing to share with folks who are my colleagues around the country as well. So thank you for that. Yep. Um, Dr. Stale, I want to uh, put it back to you. In addition to the collaboration piece um, that Dr. Valen just highlighted, we've seen models for innovation in healthcare this year, including new uses for technology, providing care through telemedicine. I think someone was saying about the stats, that would be such a great chart to show kind of the new adoption of telehealth and the rapid advancement of treatment and cures. So uh, Dr. Stale, if you could help sort of um, jump in on that innovation piece, what you've seen in terms of innovation, that would be great. Yes, Debbie. First of all, I want to just second what uh, Dr. Valin said. Collaboration was absolutely imperative and the secret of success. Not for one minute in nine months have I ever had the sense of a, a certain competition about which hospital will get which type of referrals. We were in this together. Just last week, I talked to one of the CMO colleagues at Centura to uh, make a plan for a patient who needed access to ECMO as a life-saving last resort therapy. And we were able to do that across systems. I'm extremely proud for that. The governor's task force was extremely helpful. The Colorado Hospital Association brought us all together. Even as we're speaking right now, there is a centralized transfer center for the state of Colorado across systems, across regions. When a region is at capacity, they will start transferring to other centers. At the Medical Center of Aurora, we're currently accepting patients from the new hotspots in Texas, uh, where they, those patients have nowhere else to be transferred. So the collaboration even extends beyond state lines. And I just wanted to uh, emphasize that I absolutely second everything that Dr. Valin said. Uh, with regard to innovation, let me give you a spectacular statistic. When we started out in March, we had no idea what this enigmatic virus with virus entails, how people would get sick and how to treat it and when to treat it. And we made mistakes. And like I said earlier, we failed fast. We thought getting oxygen to patients was imperative when we realized that we should actually delay the time point on which you get a patient on a ventilator because getting on a vent was a point of no return. And again, in Wuhan, 70 to 80% of patients died when they were on a then friends of mine in Germany stated that we no longer intubate because they're all going to die. Horrendous scenarios, if you think about it. Also, we did not have access to those medications, and we didn't know which, which medications work and which don't. So the number I want to give you is, in March, April, the mortality of a patient admitted to a hospital for COVID was around 20%. So one in every five patients. It's now down to globally around 0.5%. 
And I strongly believe it's our knowledge on how to stratify those patients, how to treat them sooner. For example, simple medications that uh, suppress the immune system, uh, like dexamethasone, which is one of the steroids. If patients start showing symptoms of respiratory distress, we treat them early on. Remdesivir is one of the off-label antiviral drugs, which was a nightmare to get a hold of initially. I still remember the first patient on March 1. Uh, our uh, intensivist spent about nine hours on the phone for the process to get access to just one dose. In the meantime, it's, it's a standard of care. And, and then we made mistakes. There's a drug called tocilizumab. It's a, many drugs have complex names. I don't know who, who comes up with those. But it's essentially a monoclonal antibody that blocks a molecule called interleukin-6. And we know that, uh, and, and we learned that also the hard way. We thought COVID was a disease of the elderly. Uh, people will get bilateral pneumonia and bas basically die from lack of oxygen. They suffocate in terminal respiratory distress. Suddenly we had patients that were in their 20s, 30s and 40s who did not show that sign of terminal respiratory failure, but were in hyperinflammation, that uncontrolled fever for days, those molecules in the blood were sky high, interleukin-6 and others, they call that the cytokine storm. And those patients died from blood clot problems. They had strokes, they had central pulmonary emboli, and we did not know that. So now we know how to treat those patients early. We thought attacking that interleukin-6, that was the bad guy, would save those patients until we realized that drug tocilizumab doesn't work, because interleukin-6 is just a surrogate of a redundant system of hyperinflammation that is happening. So for example, convalescent plasma was extremely effective in those patients that we treated at the medical center of Aurora. The youngest patient that died in, in my ICU was 21 years old and it's a horrendous story. And the day after he died, we had the first dose of convalescent plasma available. These drugs were not even available. Uh, early uh, in the pandemic, uh, late March, early April. Obviously, patients had not had COVID yet, and you need to be around 28 days post-COVID to donate your blood. And now we have the monoclonal antibodies. And, and, and as of this week, the vaccine that is extremely promising uh, with an efficacy shown of 95% uh, when both doses are given. Uh, and so the, there's a light at the end of the tunnel and uh, we're almost there, but not quite. We have to keep up our best practices. And the most important part I cannot overemphasize is to wear a mask in all interactions. That's the simplest, cheapest, most effective way of containing the spread of the virus. Um, probably a good Christmas gift, right? To get, get everybody a fresh supply mm. so we don't lose heart on that. Um, Josh, uh, throwing it back to you, thinking about collaboration and innovation, give us a rural perspective to kind of bring in all four corners of Colorado. Yeah, so um, I, I'd echo my two previous colleagues again as it relates to the phenomenal level of collaboration. For those participants on the call who are not in healthcare or in the healthcare circles, Denver is one of the most competitive healthcare marketplaces in the country. A lot of other markets look at the pace of change that occurs in Denver and the competitive nature to form strategies in their own communities. So the fact that the large systems were able to come together to put, put aside our competitive nature and to come together for the good of the communities that we serve, each of us across the state of Colorado um, is phenomenal. I'm sure there will come a time in the future when the world has become a little bit more normal and we'll start elbowing each other a little bit for market share but the, for us to come together and do what we've done, I think speaks to the fact that um, we've got a phenomenal healthcare system in Colorado and we are here to take care of the people who need it the most, the most fragile um, and underserved communities across the state. So thank you to my colleagues from the other, other systems. We've, we've got some great opportunities to continue that work. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's a little bit of sunshine, I think, as it relates to some good things that are gonna come out of COVID. We have quickly ramped up our virtual care and telemedicine opportunities. Um, the government has decided to pay us a little bit for those. Um, and that's been a challenge in the past. Our need to quickly ramp up, I don't know what the other systems, uh, uh, their experience was, we exponentially increased the number of telemedicine outreach visits that we were doing. 
both in our rural markets as well as our urban markets. So to bring, be able to bring that innovation and technology to um, what are known, you know, our rural communities are staunchly independent. They're not known to be early adopters of a lot of technology stuff. Although you, you can find a farmer who's driving a half a million dollar tractor with a touchscreen satellite guided planting system, but he's still using a flip phone and doesn't want to see a doctor online. He wants to see that doctor in person. And so our ability to push that early adoption into those markets and to bring those services, specialty services, subspecialty services to those folks was, was really impactful. Um, you know, one of the things that we did as a system, again, going back to rural communities do a great job with what they have. They typically don't have additional staff. They, they are not able to pivot and move as quickly as the systems are. And so the systems have a level of sophistication and technological advancement that allows us to quickly pull together a group of five systems on a Saturday and, and really make some things happen. And so the subject matter experts that we have in our systems who were working hand in hand with our state health department, our local health department, the CDC, World Health Organization, <clears throat> who were able to develop our policies and protocols around not only treatment, visitor policy and protocols. What do we do with those patients that are end of life and their family wants to be with them and they're COVID positive or, or presumed positive? So we were actually able to take that work that we were doing and just push it out to the rural markets who really didn't have, they didn't have the ability to do it from a number of different perspectives, but our ability to supply them with just kind of basic blocking and tackling elements of things that we probably in the systems take, uh, take for granted has been immensely helpful. Um, you know, we, we've been able to have conversations with some of their providers who were really concerned about their potential exposure to, to COVID and, and, and they didn't wanna come in and treat patients because they didn't understand what COVID was and they weren't sure if they wanted to expose themselves and their families. That happens at one of our big hospitals in, in the Denver Metro. We've got a plethora of doctors walking around in that hospital that can do that. Oftentimes in these rural communities, you've got one or two physicians. We've got an example in, in uh, one community where 100% of our providers were out COVID positive and 50% of our nursing staff were out COVID positive. Fortunately, we didn't have a COVID patient in the hospital, but our providers and our staff. And so in that instance, we were able to help support them with some staffing, uh, some staffing capabilities. But it just goes to show just the, the different challenges that if you get one physician who doesn't want to come in or one provider rather that doesn't want to come in and see a patient or gets COVID, you can derail the entire healthcare system for that community. And so, and I know that the other systems uh, have relationships in those markets and, and also help support them as well. So it just wasn't a sensor thing. Again, we all kind of came together, um, but it's been a challenge. The cultural issues in the rural communities create significant barriers to the early adoption of the things that we are doing in our urban centers to flatten the curve, to reduce transmission, to reduce community spread. Um, you know, we're talking about Colorado. I've got a hospital in Kansas whose county just two weeks ago gave their first mask mandate and nobody's wearing masks. It's a cultural thing. And so that plays into how we take care of those patients and the resources that the systems need to be thinking about in the back of their head as, uh, in terms of what are we going to have to potentially deploy to these rural markets because they're not wearing masks, they're not socially distancing, they're not, they're not keen on having, you know, quote the government tell them what to do and how to live their life. And so for us, the, um, the ability to collaborate with them sometimes has some, some unique barriers that we've got to get pretty creative kind of to, to problem solve with, so. Yeah, well said. I think, um... You know, it's interesting having Dr. S Dr. Stale tell us to wear a mask somehow feels different, right, than, you know, the city council member down the street or whoever else is telling you to wear a mask. So the health the healthcare system certainly has a unique role to play. Uh, I want to bring in Susan Beckman. We haven't heard from Susan yet and had a really great call with Susan earlier in the year with some other folks who are looking at COVID response um, from a federal perspective and was really impressed to hear all the different ways that HHS is involved, particularly in um, this response. So Susan, give us a sense of how did our current healthcare system perform, sort of big picture federal view from the Health and Human Services 
And it seems like our private sector companies and our healthcare network stepped up in a big way. So we'd love to hear your perspective. Thank you, Debbie. And I will agree, agree that our private sector companies in Colorado and our healthcare networks really did step in uh, big, in a big way. And thank you so much for all of you sharing your incredible stories. Um, I've had a bird's eye view of 10 different regions across the nation. And in my region, I actually represent six states. And uh, since I'm from Colorado, I've watched Colorado very quickly, uh, closely. And I'm very proud of the collaborative effort of the state, local, and hospital networks and the great job they've done. Uh, it was great to go down memory lane um, and talk about you know nine months ago and what the predictions were going to be. And into that month, we heard the predictions when you looked at what was happening back east uh, and the numbers there, it was very, very scary for Colorado. Um, hospitals couldn't get just even basic supplies of masks and uh, uh, surgical gloves. And we were really afraid that we were gonna run out of hospital beds and, and that there wouldn't be enough ventilators. But that didn't happen and I applaud all of you in the healthcare networks and the private sector. I know you all had to make some difficult decisions and a lot of sacrifices. I remember the days when uh, across the state of Colorado, rural and urban, clinics were shut down, offices were shut, dental offices shut their businesses and uh, hospitals stopped elective, elective surgeries and an effort to preserve our resources and realign our healthcare delivery systems to deal with what was uh, the COVID surge and the fear of what was going to come. And it was done in such a unified, coordinated manner that the fact is, is that no one did need to go without a ventilator or without a hospital bed. As you know, in other states, they have really suffered. And in Colorado, uh, we, we haven't had that. Uh, even though we have lost too many lives, our worst fears never materialized. And this is uh, because of the cooperation of government and private sector companies and you know, the efforts of, of the federal government. In all emergencies, uh, the federal government supports and the state manages their emergency and it's locally executed. So uh, the healthcare networks in Colorado really helped with that execution of caring for um, the COVID patients and also making sure that um, we could realign and focus our healthcare resources. From our end, we have the CARES Act, which was really put in place to uh, help with ongoing expenses, but to also replace lost revenue. And in Colorado, the federal government, it was a little more than a stimulus. It was really to keep doctors' offices and hospitals and crisis access hospitals in rural communities to keep their doors open. Uh, there was $1.2 uh, billion allocated to the Provider Relief Fund, and that went to 6,144 medical organizations just to deal with um, the expense that they were dealing with in high impact hospitals, but also the lost revenue. Of course, the federal government provided a lot of PPE. I was looking at some of the numbers uh, uh, this last week and the federal government through the strategic stockpile actually delivered 25 million N95 procedural and surgical masks to Colorado. And it, it wasn't enough. We still had shortfalls of PPE. And just recently, uh, the federal government has provided 1.7 million of the rapid by next now test which the state of Colorado is going to utilize for their youth correction facilities and public health agencies. But we also have a lot of hospitals and clinics and retails and our pharmacy partners that have set up thousands and thousands of locations across all 50 states. So that's really been great. It's good to hear about the telehealth. One of the things that uh, the pandemic did bring was a very quick look at the 50 years of regulations that were around telehealth and they wiped them clean. They did waivers on everything. And the call, uh, CMS has just made those uh, waivers permanent. And right now you can, with your phone, you can call your doctor at their home and they can bill for that service. It's from office to office, from home to home, from emergency room to 
uh, medical facility and on FaceTime and Zoom and all of the wonderful new technology we have, uh, doctors and uh, networks can now bill for that. And in, if there is a silver lining uh, to the pandemic, that is one of them. We really cleaned up a lot of licensure regulations and a lot of the burdensome, unnecessary regulations around telehealth and open that up. And then, of course, we have the vaccine and therapeutics. I'm so glad someone was mentioning how wonderful the therapeutics are because uh, we have great treatment right now. And then the vaccine uh, with Operation Warp Speed, we are distributing to Colorado 46,000 doses of the vaccine this week, the Pfizer's vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. I think it's tomorrow is uh, at the FDA for emergency use authorization, which was really exciting, but we deliver the vaccine as a federal government and it takes all of the resources and planning of the local health networks and private sector because our pharmacies are playing a big role in vaccinating our nursing homes and our staff and our long-term care facilities. Um, and I, I think we've got a great plan in place and I do think there is such a great light at the end of the tunnel. Colorado's done a great job. Uh, their collaboration and coordination amongst state, local, counties, uh, hospitals, community health networks has been really, really good. And we made some hard, crucial decisions at the right time. And I think we're, we really, our, our population and the people that you serve have really benefited from it. So I want to thank you for all your hard work. I know it's been a long nine months. So thank you so much. Susan for weighing in and giving us that federal perspective. And you've had, um, I suspect when you took this position, you didn't think about all the other logistics and things that would be certainly on your plate with the HHS. So glad that you're looking out for Colorado. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Alan Davis, jumping back to you, you know, we've talked a little bit about collaboration. We've talked about innovation. I think now we're looking beyond the challenges and looking at what's possible perhaps for healthcare in the future. And I wonder if you'd wanna to speak to that with some positive momentum. Um, is there a sense from you, you know, looking ahead to what the healthcare industry could be? Um, what, what, what vision could you paint for us today? No, yeah, well, um, and actually what I think I'll do in a second is actually um, pop up some very quick slides and walk through these. You know what, um, there's, there's a whole, there's actually a book called Leadership on the Line by um, a professor from Harvard named Heifetz. Uh, uh, and what we are in the midst of is not a technical challenge here. It, there's a little bit, there's no doubt that there was a little bit, there, was, there were things that were new and different. Um, but we had all we really needed, I think, in order to really, it's, it should, it's, it's a wonderful thing. It's remarkable that we've gotten a vaccine created and the therapeutics we figured out in such a, a very short time. It's all predicated on science and, you know, discoveries that were happening behind the scenes that nobody, you know, paid any attention to except unless you were in the, the, the field. The real interesting thing listening to the comments of my colleagues is that um, it's really the recognition in terms of how we've responded is, is re recognizing that we were in the midst of probably one of the biggest adaptive challenges that we have faced, you know, where the people with the problem have to be part of helping us solve it. You know, we didn't have simple answers to these things. We had to, as I've said, um, balance a whole lot of competing and conflicting priorities. Um, and so um, what I think, why I'm excited about what could happen for healthcare out of this, put, you know, we'll, we'll, they, we will hopefully get to a point because I don't, we're all hoping this isn't our meteor, as I've said in the past too, thinking about, you know, for the human species, is this our meteor? Um, thankfully, I think we can say not, um, but it's really about then how do we, but despite the fact that, yeah, we know which, room, which rooms we're in when we compete, and which rooms it's important to collaborate. How do we use all of what we're learning to think about um, uh, how we solve the problems that are still there with respect to healthcare affordability and quality and the care experience? None of that's gone away. But what I thought I'd do is real quickly just, and I will not tell the stories I told attendant with these um, particular leadership lessons, but what I wanted to do, um, and I just realized that I, took it away from myself. Can you see my um, screen? 
with the top 10 critical lessons. Yeah, great. As that I'd walk through just the, the words um, and I, I suspect underneath each one of these, every single one of my colleagues could tell like uh, a myriad of stories that support these critical lessons that we've learned. So I'll just tell them. The first is we had to write at the beginning, remember we'd never done this before. So when you're in that sort of a space, you know that you've got to flatten the hell out of hierarchies, frankly, and everybody has stuff to uh, contribute and we're gonna learn as we go. So we had our agility and our flexibility um, challenge. One of the things that was met, a comment made earlier is that we drilled for this and we knew we drilled for it, but what we didn't drill for in those things was context. And I think that's one of the things we're gonna look forward to and need to come back to again and again is that context matters, the geopolitical, the socio-cultural, the economic, all those sorts of factors manage and that's why it's a matter. And that's why it's not just a technical, these are adaptive exercises. That really cool things emerged, whether it's technology, um, whether it's how we work together, how we work across systems, but the emergence of the novel requires constant vigilance. And heaven knows while we may be tired, um, it, it's really, at least I will personally say it's been a, it's an, it's an exhilarating fatigue that we have because we've had to attend to rapid change along with the ability to translate. And we have to bring our teams along the journey the whole time, especially when information is changing as quickly as it was. There's this crazy way we stay in our lane. I'm an OBGYN at a neuro rehab hospital. That's not what they hired me to do here. I know what lane I'm in, but I also, and we need everybody to have the opportunity to put their voices in the room and bring their strengths and creativity into the room that we have to learn how to have better arguments and then support decisions when we come out of the rooms. Um, a, a healthy dose of both grace and forgiveness for ourselves as we learn and go along the way and have these way bigger than this as we go along. Uh, I, I'd mentioned about a flex, flexibility and ad, agility. The muscles were definitely stretched and we are where we are in Colorado, let alone in the nation, but for sure here, I think in large part because we have um, as leaders of these systems done a lot of this sort of thing. Um, as I've said, uh, just a, an ocean of competing and conflicting priorities. Um, and interestingly, this next one is a perfect example of that. The science is important, but I certainly know to this audience, there are a lot of other things that are as well and to us as well. We, have we, are, business, we are businesses to run to, we get it. And this tension that we have um, had to sort of figure out how to navigate through when we know what the science is and what is absolutely critical in stopping the virus. But um, we have an economy that um, I don't think it's hyperbole to say is in um, shambles right now and a lot of rebuilding and lives that have been um, uh, hurt in so many ways by this. We've got to be able to figure out as we go forward that the, even around solving our healthcare woes, how do we balance both of those things? that um, we learned early on that you've got to still use a values lens and the five values we've used through this to manage. And I think that's something that we ought to think about as we talk about how we're gonna move ahead with um, whatever the next version of healthcare reform or adjustments looks like is to articulate what the values. And we had five that we've used here, safety, equity, fairness, sustainability, and trust. And all the decisions we've made, we make them through that values lens. Um, this is one I learned long ago, and all of us who are docs know this so well, especially any of us who spend time in the OR. Um, so long as the pilot isn't panicking, I won't either. And it's been really, really important that we um, sort of keep our cools, know the rooms in which um, it's okay to have some emotion, but that the extent to which we as leaders have a steady hand on the till really, really um, reinforces the confidence and um, that our teams need to do that bedside work that they have to do every day which gets to this one. And we spent a lot of time on this one, tending to the hearts of the team, but also yourselves, ourselves as leaders, knowing when we need to not only put on our masks to keep the virus out, but um, oxygen masks first. Um, and so what we've been in is this uh, volatile, uncertain, complex um, uh, period and ambiguous period. And I think that we ought to be thinking about how do we take the, these sorts of lessons learned too, not just the technical, which are gonna really, really um, help us the two together uh, to march forward. Um, I know you have another question, so I'll, I'll wait with answering it because I really, it, the, the, what I'd end with is that while we've talked about the light at the end of the tunnel, there's a, there's a wonderful um, uh, sign when we come down I-70 from the mountains that I've just, I actually found and I 
show it on the Zoom calls. Truckers, we're not down yet. You know, the one on I-70. Truckers, you're not down yet. And we've got to, we've got to continue to figure out how to really mod modulate that break and that accelerator over the next several months as we make our way through this. I, I agree. It sounds like if we're all excited about the vaccine, uh, you know, we're thinking, okay, we're, we're totally through and it's going to take many, many months to provide that for all Coloradans. So um, great lessons in leadership. Dr. Ellen Davis, I think that's a really important point. Um, I want to shift us for a couple minutes to talk about, um, you know, we've talked about opportunities and challenges and looking ahead to some degree, and would love to get some feedback on some of the remarks from Chris Brown from CSI at the beginning. As, as you probably know, you know, there's so much that you already have on your plate in terms of healthcare and innovation and solving some of these challenges. But as a, as a group that focuses on public policy, policy issues, we know that coming down, um, there's a potential for some changes to the healthcare system in Colorado. And I would love to get a sense of if you could provide counsel to Colorado's policymakers um, at the state level and the local level, what advice would you give them to ensure that Colorado has a strong and effective healthcare system? And, and none of you work in this sort of public policy sphere um, but so you may you may decide to take a pass and that's fine too. But as we're as we're thinking about how public policy affects businesses like the ones I represent with Coburn, it's certainly public policy will affect affect healthcare in the future. So I'd love to give you a chance to weigh in. Um, Josh, we'll start with you. We'll kind of go in reverse order and, and this will be just kind of a short feedback if that's okay. Yeah, you know, figuring out <clears throat> figuring out the uh, compensation methodologies for rural hospitals is going to be big from a public policy perspective. Um, we need we need our elected officials to know and understand how challenging the rural healthcare environment is um, in a normal uh, in a normal world, much less uh, in the middle of an international pandemic. Um, and so, figuring out how to create long term financial sustainability so that we're allowed to be good stewards of our dollars um, is going to be a key. You know, we've a, a number of our hospitals have gotten um, payroll protection plan uh, dollars as well as CARES dollars from HHS. The challenge is we there's there's we still lack some clarity uh, from the HHS side on exactly what we can spend it on. And so some folks have taken the risk and spent some of those dollars. Um, some like our hospitals have, have held on to those, and um, and we're working closely with HHS and other other government officials to help define that. Um, and so. The, the impact, the financial impact that this is going to have on our rural hospitals, we will see critical access hospitals across the country close. Pre-COVID, there were over 600 hospitals that had closed and nearly double that many that were at risk of closure. And so if, if we're not careful and we're not looking at the true impact of public, public policy across the board and the differences in the economic impacts of that uh, that exist in the rural versus the urban market, and we could potentially hamper our ability to, to deliver high quality care to the, some of our most vulnerable and, um, and, and needy uh, communities across the state. Dr. Stale, any advice for public policymakers as they're looking at the healthcare system? I pride myself to work at a hospital that truly serves a mission for an underserved community in Aurora. And, and what I see, the main problem is access to timely appropriate care and for example, at the Medical Center of Aurora, we provide a significant amount of uncompensated care. And I know it remains a conundrum to find a solution in terms of choice, covering pre-existing conditions, uh, maybe restoring the individual mandate. Uh, but I, I still believe in, in the modern state of Colorado, and I'll quickly pivot back to the vaccine. We are a privileged state in a privileged country. If you look at the stats, uh, we have access to the vaccine now. Many other countries, including third world countries, do not. And I still see um, inappropriate care in terms of patients not being able to access care until they're at the worst uh, when they arrive in our ED. So to assure that patients have access, whether it's uh, also navigating through telemedicine at this time and having uh, access for timely care, uh, care is remains an unresolved conundrum in our community. Great, Dr. Vallon. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, you know, what I would say is, you know, we have an amazing healthcare system in Colorado, which I think, it, you know, is evidenced by our what I would say is our superior results in this state uh, compared to how other states even fared with it, with across the country. Um, I think that, you know, from a physician perspective, and I'll just throw my my physician hat on as as you know, and I'm not a, as you said a public policy uh, individual. It um, the power of collaboration and coming together to solve a wickedly hard problem that was fast moving, highly complex, and impacted every part of 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 the healthcare system. The only way we could solve that wickedly hard problem was to come together and, and collaborate. And so for public policymakers, I mean, my my advice would be make sure you're engaging all of the all of the, the key stakeholders, and we have to all come together to collaborate to solve this. This is not it's not a problem with one part of the of the system that can be solved by another part of the system. This, you know, healthcare, our affordability, our access, our continued quality uh, as we go forward is a wickedly hard problem. And we are all committed to that end result. We've got to figure out how to collaborate to get to that result. Sounds like the collaborative group that you already put together could be a first step, perhaps. So, <laughs> and put put uh, put all of you in that in that room to be convening and collaborating. Uh, Dr. Allen Davis, anything else to weigh in from the public policy perspective? Sure, and you know I have that public policy lens because I did the government and external relations work for KP for over nine years. Um, you know the AHA just um, released an, an environmental scan. That's why I looked back to to find, I think it's really, really worth a, a, a good look. And the reason I thought I'd lead with that is because um, uh, I'm gonna use an ICU metaphor for a minute. And when a patient, whether it's one of my OB patients or GYN patients or other trauma patients that many of you take care of is in the ICU, that's not the time I'm thinking about their cholesterol. And when that patient um, comes out of the ICU, especially when we think about what our COVID, our post COVID patients have been through, we don't get them running marathons right away. Um, our healthcare system has taken a tremendous hit and every system is perfectly designed to achieve what it achieves and achieves. And the healthcare system sets inside this economic system that we sit in and is a huge economic engine. Um, we are not done with the impacts and the implications of COVID. And what I would suggest back to my yellow sign, which you know, truckers were not down yet, that there's a short term sort of response, I'd say. And I'd say, this is the time to go slow. Let us get some stability. We've got to stabilize the healthcare system, which we've got, my belief is at least another year of just working through the complexities and the vagaries that have happened to the systems as a result of COVID. Um, so we need to do that before we go back to some of the work. And listen, I, I was a policy person for a long, long time um, that I know we have to do within the healthcare system. It is unaffordable. It is inequitable. It is not safe as it should be for you know, all the riches that we have here in this country. You know, just being incredibly direct, my belief is this is not the year to take on. Um, you know, sort of getting back to, uh, to quote business as usual when we're still in the midst of a forest fire. So that would be my, that would be my guidance. Let's work through this. And by the way, start to catalog those things that we're learning through this that we can leverage as we start to figure out how to improve the system um, in terms of what are the midterm and then the long-term things we're going to need to face. Great. Thank you. And, and kind of along those lines, too, I wanted to add in a couple. We're going to do a, just a tiny bit of Q&A from the business community. And we asked two of our partners to join us today, um, Juliet Abdul, who's the CEO of the Westminster Chamber. And we've got Jeff Keener, who's the CEO of the South Metro Denver Chamber, if they want to go ahead and pop on. And Jeff, we'll start with you. Um, and we don't have a time for everybody to answer the question. But Jeff, perhaps you could pose a question. We'll see if anybody wants to tackle it. If not, we'll We'll uh, table it for another time, but uh, Jeff Keener, welcome. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Uh, my question on behalf of the South Metro Denver Chamber is this, from a provider perspective, what would you suggest or consider as viable alternatives to what both the federal government and the state legislatures are looking at for solving cost of care concerns and patient access? And I'll just open that up. I don't know if anybody on the panel wants to 
wants to tackle that or we can certainly table that for another time. But um, it is it is a concern from the business community. It's a big it's a big question that you've asked, Jeff. Um, and what I uh, say in, in terms of answers is, yes, it's probably something that we could spend you know, another one of your, ses your, ses your uh, sessions on the cost of care for employers is really, um, you know, I mean, it's been outrageous for way, way too long and we know we've got to deal with it. I think um, there are some things that have happened in recent years in terms of what the Affordable Care Act attempted to do that have been rolled back. I heard, do we need to revisit this individual mandate issue? Are there some other things we need to do to sort of stabilize that side of um, healthcare economics? and making it more affordable. There's some interesting work that's already going on, which is how you'd really love it to be, that the feds or the state, the, that is the public, that policy doesn't have to solve it, that we solve it on our own, where some systems are getting into uh, more collaborative relationships with insurers, where we're holding each other's feet to the fire around quality and value. Um, and I think that that's work that we need to continue to do. And we probably need to talk more about what's going on there, lest people think nothing's going on. Um, I think. Uh, Dr. Vallon said it well, it's a huge, complex, messy, sticky wicket that we're not going to solve overnight. So. Great. And that's it's a good point. It's it's a sticky wicket for sure. Um, Juliet Abdel with Westminster Chamber has a question as well or a comment. Juliet? Well, thank you so much, Debbie, and to everyone that's on this panel. This was an incredibly um, just informative presentation. I appreciate all that you're doing. Um, this question does, is very similar to Jeff in nature that it's related to kind of a change in the overall healthcare system. With, with everything that you all were going through right now and the costs and the impact on you as a healthcare provider, how would that be affected by a change in the healthcare system, whether it comes from the state, whether it comes federally? Um, we know that Colorado is very focused on being one of the initial two states to put something out there. With COVID, obviously that put a pause into place, but now we're hearing the federal implication that might be there. And so just curious, how does that equate on your side? Where, where are you seeing that that would make the most sense? Yeah, I, I'll just echo what uh, Dr. Alan Davis shared. Uh, you know, this is this is a top of mind um, issue for all of us. I know is, is really a focus on access and affordability. Um, I do think that uh, I'll also echo with with where Dr. Alan Davis shared. Yeah, you know, we're still in the midst of uh, of the pandemic, and um, as as exciting as it is that we've vaccinated. You know, I just got a text that says we we're up to 1,100 people that we've vaccinated in the last 36 hours. Here, that's amazing, um, and it puts us in a great great position. We're not past this. It's going to be. I mean, we're we're talking about getting to the senior population in you know January, February. General population probably not until you know second quarter uh, of this year. We're still in the in the midst of this. Um, I, it's it is an important issue. You know, our hope is that you know we take this on and we we think about it, we learn take the lessons we've learned through this you know collaboration and move forward. But in terms of you know, taking on a, a major policy shift in the midst of this. I'll just uh, the other the final part that I will I will you know end with, which is you know we've got to remember the the folks who are the true heroes of of this this pandemic, which is our frontline healthcare workers, our nurses, our doctors, our you know staff in our in our locations who literally ran into a burning building not knowing what was going to happen, which was to go in and and take care of COVID patients. They're tired, they're fatigued, they still, we're still not even through this um, and we still have a, have a surge. Our hospitals today are still totally, totally full and busy. We've got to recover from that. We've got to figure out how to recover from that. We've got to get to the other side of this uh, to, to be able to move this forward. I think there'll be a lot of good discussion. Our hope is that nothing, no, you know, now's not the time to make a massive pivot and change that will uh, strain our, our our workers and our and our systems as we go as we finish out and end the pandemic. And thanks for the questions, Juliet and Jeff. And we've got a lot of different questions coming in from our business community. And I think what I'm hearing you all say is, uh, give us a minute. Like, really, <laughs> we're just starting to maybe see the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, a year from now, and have a much different um, Colorado looking ahead. So why? Um, you know, throw a wrench in what already is kind of a really nice, um, you know, light at the end of the tunnel. But um, I really like that idea. I think um, 
that just came in that discussion of perhaps another session that we have involving some more of our private sector folks for some additional collaboration about the voice of the payer, the voice of the employer, and how any changes in public policy would certainly affect all Coloradans and um, understanding how some of those cost shifts might work and, and affect um, you know, all of us. And I would just say, I think my main takeaway from today's discussion really is that collaboration has been a cornerstone of the success that we've seen in Colorado from our healthcare network. And it's also a sign of real success when it comes to public policy that we need to have everybody in the room, including the folks on this call and, and also all the different stakeholders in terms of any public policy um, remedy going forward. So I just want to again thank you. Um, thank you to the panelists who joined today. I know that you have incredibly vital roles within your care system and it, it took something for you to make time to carve this out today. We will be showing this as well. Um, it'll be on our website. So it'll be a, a very broad audience that'll be able to get the really critical information that you provided. Um, when it comes to improving healthcare, you know, what I'm hearing from our partners is uh, Coloradans, of course, they want, they want it all, lower costs, improved access, higher quality of care. But I'm very optimistic when I hear about the innovation taking place rapidly within our healthcare system in Colorado. And it was an honor to showcase this rapid progress. Um, as we're looking ahead to programming that we're gonna provide um, issues like the public option that might be proposed in Colorado, um, we're going to convene again um, some of our folks within the different sectors um, that have concern about um, government putting their hand into issues that could be left, best left to the private sector to determine. So uh, we're going to be part of the conversation and we hope that you'll join us. Um, I'm now thinking about the folks who are listening to the video. Um, if you have interest in collaborating on this important issue, if you're a business owner, um, uh, part of the private sector and have an anecdote on how healthcare and business sectors can work together to overcome um, some of these issues, um, shoot me an email and let me know how we can um, further work with you. And we'll be doing some other programming upon, up on this very important topic and bringing the voice of business in on the next round. So um, with that, I wanna let everybody know for more information, you can go to covert.com. That's where the video will be housed. And we look forward to engaging with you on other issues of vital importance to Colorado. And one last thank you to the panelists again for today, representing lots of different um, hospital systems and uh, that are a big part of what we're experiencing in Colorado. And we're grateful for your innovation and collaboration. So thanks everyone for joining and this concludes our program. Thank you, Debbie.